Welcome back to FX Street. It is Thursday, September 10th, 2009. Welcome back, one and all. Great that you could join us. Uh, my name is Adam Rosen. I'll be your host for the next 45 minutes or so. Very special thank you to everyone for joining us and to FX Street for hosting this webinar. A very fun topic today. We're going to talk about last week's non-farm payrolls. We're going to talk about some economic numbers this week and their implications for the charts. So of course, if at any time, if you have any questions, don't, do not hesitate to chat them in. We'd love to see questions and comments. And more in general, relevant is to send everybody an excerpt from an article on Bloomberg.com. The Bank of England said it plans to keep buying as much as 175 billion pounds, about 290 billion dollars in assets, to cement the economy's recovery from the worst recession in a generation. The decision by the nine-member Monetary Policy Committee, led by Governor Mervyn King, was forecast by all 35 economists in a Bloomberg News survey. Furthermore, and this is really the point, the central bank also kept the benchmark interest rate at 0.5% as predicted in a separate survey of 60 forecasts. The Bank of England met at 7 a.m. Eastern about an hour and a half ago. They were expected by all economists, and myself included, to keep rates unchanged at half a percent. They did. Initial claims at 550,000? Wow. Well, how do we make sense of this? Or more importantly, how do we make use of this information? Well, we're looking at a pound dollar five minute chart, and I'll show you a very simple way I like to trade the economic numbers. And then we're going to zoom out to the daily charts and try to make a little bit more sense of this. But going to a five minute chart, using the non farm payrolls, or using today's Bank of England meeting, or whatever it may be, uh, we, what we want to do is find the exact candlestick, the five minute candlestick that the announcement was made. So in a five-minute chart, going back to 7 a.m. Eastern, we see this long candlestick wick. That's exactly at 7 a.m. Eastern. That's when the announcement was made. Now, moving forward, I want to count three five-minute candlesticks forward, marking off with horizontal lines the highs and lows of the three five-minute candlesticks, the highest high and the lowest low the, mar low the market was able to achieve during the 15 minutes following the release of the economic uh, indicator, such as the central bank meeting in this case. So the highest high we see for the three five-minute candlesticks is 165.96, mark off a horizontal line. Mark off another horizontal line, the lowest low, 165.43. So 165.43 to 165.96. Now, that's our 15-minute trading range. I like to call it the 15-minute cooling off period range because it allows cooler heads prevail. You see, during the first 15 minutes, there's usually a massive influx of buyers and sellers. It's a little bit irrational at times. It's a little bit illogical. It does not provide us, in my opinion, I think, with information that we can actually use to place a trade. But what the mark, how the market acts after that 15 minutes is very, very important. What we like to do is wait for three five-minute candlesticks to close above resistance, above 165.96 or below support, 165.43. Now the day trading side of the strategy dictates that we would buy only after three five minute candlesticks close above the high or close below the low. Well in this case we have one candlestick, two, three. This red candlestick actually gave us a buy signal. We would have to play stops below the 165.43 and then hold on, referencing longer-term charts to look for areas that take profit. But what this tells us is after the central bank met, and after literally all the foreign exchange traders all over the world received the news at just about the same period of time, they made their decisions. You see, on, every, on the basis of every economic number, whether it's initial jobless claims released just a few minutes ago, the Bank of England decision released about an hour and a half ago, or in about 25 minutes from now, we have a Bank of Canada meeting too. So it's a very timely discussion, a lot of big economic numbers. Or in regards to the non-farm payrolls last Friday, first Friday of every month, a lot of traders jump into the market, whether it's the small traders with the mini lots and the micro lots, or the large traders or the super large traders and the institutions. Whatever the trader, whatever their size is, we make decisions based on economic numbers. Non-farm payroll is better than expected. Wow, the U.S. economy is better than I thought it was. Let's buy something. If it's worse than expected, last week the non-farm, not the non-farm payrolls, but the unemployment rate unexpectedly rose from 9.4 to 9.7%. So that was a big piece of news. The more significant the news is, the more traders, the more, the greater amount of traders 
it drags, it attracts to the market to either buy or sell. A little piece of news, initial jobless claims, well, it's a weekly number. So we know we're going to get another number next week. Therefore, I don't think it's as big of a piece of news. Non-farm payrolls, like the PPI, like the CPI, are once a month. Central bank meetings are sometimes, well, in the U.S., they're every six weeks or so. The, the greater amount of time in between economic numbers, the more significant, I think, the, the actual event is. But getting back to the charts and getting back to our strategy, again, we would mark off the lows and the highs of this 15-minute trading range, the first three five-minute candlesticks, uh, to, to emerge after the 7 a.m. Bank of England decision, then we would wait for three more five-minute candlesticks to cross above the high or cross below the low and close as a new high or new low, and then we would either buy a new high, sell a new low, and we would place our protective stops on the other side of the entire range. What's hair do you trade for U.S. unemployment rate? It's a great question. For U.S. numbers, I like to focus on, obviously, currencies that contain the U.S. dollar, but... I like to trade a currency pair. It, it, it does, the answer is it changes from time to time. If the pound is very, very active for their own UK-related reasons, I may avoid the pound dollar. If the euro is very, very active for eurozone news, I may avoid the euro dollar. I like to find a currency pair where I think the dollar will be the primary driving force in that currency pair, meaning that if it's a U.S. piece of news, such as the U.S. unemployment rate, and if I, the, uh, the unemployment rate was higher than expected. Therefore, if my trade was to sell short the U.S. dollar, well, I'm going to sell short the U.S. dollar against another currency that I think the minimum will be neutral or may be a little bit stronger. But neutral is best. So uh, in terms of last week, at that time, the dollar Swissy, the euro dollar were very, very quiet. The pound dollar has been a little bit more active, so I tend to favor those currency pairs. But we're going to look at the euro dollar, something very interesting that's happening right now with the euro and the dollar swissy. The reason why I really like this strategy, not only from a technical standpoint, but also just to understand it fundamentally, is because, again, the greater, the more significant the piece of news, the more traders, the more buy and sell orders will probably be executed based on that piece of news, and then we have a massive amount of buyers and sellers that come together. And then the subsequent move, the move that happens after that, remember, we wait for three five-minute candlesticks to close, and then I want to wait, I want to wait for three more five-minute candlesticks to close above resistance or below support. Now, to, to answer your question, do we have to wait for the candlestick to close? I do. I absolutely do wait for the candlestick to close, especially when we're talking about five-minute candlesticks. Because a long candlestick wick, especially on a five-minute or a short-term chart, can be the result either of a false tick. It can be the result of uh, just a chart you know, inaccuracy. And it can also just be a temporary spike. I like to wait for the candlestick to close because it gives us a little bit more of a solid indication of which way the market's heading. Do you draw support and resistance on the range of the three candlesticks? Absolutely. I draw a horizontal line at the high and the low of the, of the 15 minutes following the release of the economic number. So in the Bank of England's decision this morning at 7 a.m. Eastern, the, candles, the first candlestick from 7 to 7.05, 7.05 to 7.10 to 7.15. 15 candlestick, an absolute high that was achieved during that, again, we'll wait for three more five-minute candlesticks to clear resistance below, below support, once 43. Now, this is fine for a day trading, uh, looking for a day, a day trade. However, this strategy, I think, also lays a great foundation into longer-term trades also, and I'll show you what I mean. Let's go to a daily chart of the pound dollar, and again, the horizontal, I'm sorry, the vertical line, this red line, is today's candlestick marks the Bank of England decision, and we'll see overall the pound dollar right now is in a range. The range, I would say, is the resistance we have to look up to 167.43. Those are the highs of June 30th. That's the highest high if you exclude the head of what I think could be a head and shoulders. So in other words, I think 167 is a big level. Looking to the downside, uh, the lowest low on a daily chart uh, would be 161. After the release of a big economic number, I like to observe, I like to see how the market's going to behave. Let's say, for example, the pound dollar then, later on today, goes up to 167 and actually closes up above 167. That tells me that after all those buyers and sellers came together, 
that now the pound dollar, because of pound strength and or dollar weakness, has now managed to close at a new high. This tells us that if we were to go out and physically make a count of all the buyers and all the sellers, there would, there would be a greater amount, a much, much greater amount of buyers versus sellers that has propelled the pound dollar up to a new level. Let me put it a different way. Uh, a friend of mine I used to work with used to have this fantastic saying. He would say that the fundamentals of the market are, or the, the highs, he would say this way. If I'm going to quote him, I should quote him correctly. He would say that the highs and lows of the markets are marked by fundamental events. The lows and the highs of the markets are marked by fundamental events. It's the technical analysis that explains everything in between. Fundamental analysis, when we look at economic numbers, non-farm payrolls, unemployment figures, whatever it may be, that's fundamental analysis. That, that marks off the highs and the lows. That tells us that the Dow Jones Industrial Average was not going to stay above 14,000 too long, and eventually we saw a huge move to the downside over the past few years. And eventually the Dow went down to 6,000, and then fundamentally there was more of a reason for the Dow to go up as opposed to go down. Now, what happened in between 14,000 to 6,000, and then from 6,000 back up to, well, almost 10,000, everything in between, that's technical analysis. That's chart reading. And, you know, that's where we can add our value. The question is, in our case, a fifth five-minute candle to close, why use three five-minute candlesticks uh, to mark off the highs and the lows? Then any number of candlesticks that it takes, the greater amount of time that it takes to cross above resistance or below support, I actually like to trade better. I don't like to see, I do not like to see the market break resistance or break support very quickly. I like to see a greater amount of traders get involved. I mean, after all, we see three five-minute candlesticks. Now, how many more candlesticks do we take in order for us to actually break out? We'll count one, two, three, four, five. I count about six candlesticks. So after the first 15 minutes, it took another six candlesticks or another 30 minutes for the market to actually break out. That tells me, well, how many traders could possibly have gotten involved in the pound dollar within 30 minutes? Well, let's put all, all the time together, 45 minutes. The, tr the, the number was released at 7 a.m. Eastern. The, the breakout actually occurred about 7.45. Well, let's count how many buyers in the pound dollar in 45 minutes. Probably a lot. But if we had stayed in this range for the next four or five hours, how many more traders would have been able to get involved? You know, if we have, let's just make up some numbers. Let's say we have a 1,000 traders who shorted the pound dollar and another 1,000 traders who bought the pound dollar. And keeping in mind that there's millions and millions and millions of traders all over the world involved on one, on one level or another, okay. So we have a 1,000 buyers, a 1,000 sellers. Eventually, we break out to new high. Well, all those buyers, they have a little bit more margin. Maybe they're going to buy a little bit more. That pushes the market even higher. But... 1,000 traders who are sold shorts, well, as soon as we break out, they either get stopped out or uh, they get a margin call or just they decide just to close their trade and maybe even turn around and buy the pound dollar. Well, that, mean, that means those 1,000 shorts either buy their, their position to close it or buy the position to actually go long. Well, 1,000 traders, let's take those 2,000 traders. If you take the 2,000 traders and divide it by the millions and millions of millions, it's a very, very small percentage of the foreign exchange market that has actually been put at a critical level. A critical level meaning we bought it a couple minutes ago and now we're either making good money or we're losing good money. However, if we had waited, if the market had waited uh, three hours, four hours, maybe even one day for the breakout, how many more buyers and how many more sellers would have been able to get involved? That's a greater amount of push to the upside, a greater amount of push to the downside. Uh, the, to answer your question, in this case, we have a range of 65.43 to 65.96. I would wait for three more five minutes candlesticks to close. And my entry would be as low as possible after the third five-minute candlestick. Now, if former was new support, we may have chose to wait for a pull. 65.96, former high becomes new low. Former resistance, some an uptrend, we won't come back more than of inside the range. 65.43 to 65.96 is about 50 pips. Say, more than likely, I'm going to try to buy it between 165.70 to 165.96. I don't want to buy it too much higher than that because it's a bad risk-reward ratio. And if we pull back below 165.70, I might hold off 
because if we cross back towards the back over the middle of this range, I might get a little skeptical about about buying it because maybe it's a false breakout. But regardless of that, we have our, our day trading strategy. But now, go to the daily chart now, we have a resistance, a big level above us, that's 167. That's that horizontal blue line. That represents a neckline of a possible head and shoulders. The first shoulder, I think the high is 167.43 on June 30th. I think the head is all the way at the top on the daily chart. That's on August 5th. And the rule of thumb is the second shoulder should come very, very close to the, ha the high of the first shoulder. First shoulder high, 167.43. I'd like to round it up to the next larger round figure, which is 167.50. So as long as we do not break above 167.50, frames a pretty bearish case, meaning we sell short here with an anticipation we're going to go back to the downside. The rationale is, hey, why wasn't the mark? Why was the market only able to break to new highs once? Why do we pull back so much? Why do we now fail to go up to new highs again? An uptrending market makes higher highs and lower lows. Now we're made, we've made a higher high. Now we've made a lower high, and we've made similar lows. So this is this for this reason. Head and shoulders typically tend to break in the opposite direction of the head. The head to the top, we would expect a break to the bottom. But going back to our economic event, the Bank of England meets. They're expected to keep rates unchanged, which they did half a percent, and they continued. They agreed to continue with the purchase plan, asset purchase plan. All that fundamental information, I'm going to pretend like I don't know what that means. All I know is something big happened, and after something big happened, I want to see how the market reacts. Uh, to make a very simple analogy, we're heading towards the end of baseball season. Well, we have a couple of different baseball teams, and one makes a very, very big trade. They traded a very bad player for a very, very good player. And all of a sudden, that baseball team that was doing very, very poorly, that could not win a game, now they've won three, four, five games in a row. Something big fundamentally has changed. I'm not, you know, a P I do not have a PhD in economics, so it's really, it's a little bit beyond my realm of expertise to, to look at the unemployment rate, to look at the Bank of England's asset purchase program, and to make a 100% educated guess as far as what do I think this will do? What is the impact that it will have to the foreign exchange market? I'm not that smart. All I know is what the charts tell me. And the charts tell me that right now we're in a range. And right now, we know a big fundamental event occurred. I want to wait for the market now to give me a clue. Is the market going to act happy? The pound dollar is going to go up. Is the market going to act sad? Is the pound dollar going to go down? I want to see how this acts. Now, uh, we promised to talk about the non-farm payroll, so we're going to go to a euro-dollar chart. We're going back to last Friday. Last Friday was non-farm payrolls. That was August uh, no, I'm sorry, September 4th, first Friday of every month. Non-farm payrolls was a little bit better than expected, but the unemployment rate was a little worse than expected. So which way do we go? Well, fundamentally, it's beyond me. But technically, we know what we're doing. I marked off a, hor uh, sorry, a vertical line. This red line on the euro-dollar daily chart represents September 4th. Let's pretend I did not read the news and I don't know what the unemployment rate was. I do not know what the non-farm payroll is released, and I really don't know what that impact is to the U.S. economy. But, zooming in, all I know is that we had a range round market for a long, long time. We had a range round market, arguably, that started June, the beginning of June, and until only a few days ago, well, the beginning of September, so we have all involved in the foreign exchange market. We don't know exactly why the euro dollar yesterday finally decided to break above resistance. We're at 145.92. This is the highest level we've seen in quite a while. This is the highest level we've seen actually uh, going back to levels back in December. So these are the highest levels we've seen in 2009. Was it because of non-farm payrolls? I think it's because, you know, the, the market price, 145.95 euro dollar, that price is a result of all the different fundamental events and all the different traders reacting to those different fundamental events. But putting, if we break above this Fibonacci level, and it looks like we're just breaking out of a long range bound market, if we now break above this Fibonacci level, this tells us that the next solid anticipated resistance is the 78.6% Fibonacci level that stands currently above 152. My personal theory is that the longer the market stays in the range, the more violent the breakout will subsequently be. Again, getting back to just the simple behavior, again, 
if we have buyers and sellers that get involved, let's say 10 buyers and 10 sellers, eventually when the market breaks out, well, it's probably not going to break out too much. Ten shows, you know, more. Imagine in the euro dollar, which is the most actively traded currency pair in our foreign exchange universe. At one point, I heard that the euro dollar represents half of all the volume in the foreign exchange market, if you can imagine that. Well, imagine how many buys and how many sells, how many trades were placed if going back all of June, all of July, and all of August. There's a lot of money that has been put into the market or taken out of the market over a three-month period of time. Consider all the economic, economic news that has, has occurred. So those buyers and all those sellers, now there's an inequilibrium, in meaning the sellers. Anyone who has purchased a euro-dollar pair and is still holding on to the trade over the past three months, almost every single one is probably making money, unless you just bought it up here at 146. The Bank of England was expected to keep rates unchanged. The F the Federal Open Market Committee in the U.S., they're expected to keep rates unchanged during their next meeting. But it's much more important, what is their plan moving forward? Are they going to continue the asset repurchase program? Uh, clunk assist, that's more important. Let's now, as we drag continue to see as high as 1.865. You may ask, well, why can't I plot this on a CAD yen chart? You can. I don't like to use yen crosses. I, tend to, I find that they tend to be too volatile. And I, I found that this strategy, this 15-minute strategy, does not produce as accurate results. I like the dollar crosses. We're actually kind of lucky because the dollar seems to be one of the most active currencies these days. Now, we're going to continue to drag this line down. We have lows now on the dollar CAD at 108.15, uh, the highs of 108.65. Your charts might be off by, by one or by may vary by one or two pips. Uh, they're independent chart feeds. But... Needless to say, the dollar CAD, let's go to a daily chart for a moment, and let's take a look at what the chart's telling us. Zooming out on the daily chart, we have a long-term, long-term trend to the downside, marked by this long blue resistance line. Most recently, it was a double top pattern, 38.2% to the notch retracement level, and downtrending resistance. Everything came together around 111.23. I'm going to zoom in for a moment because this is really important. I really like when this happens. I like to see when a price level, when there's a particular price level, we're going to say roughly 110 uh, to 111, that area, okay? I really like it when different technical indicators all come together and tell me the same price level is important. If we were to zoom out on this daily chart, we draw our, our downtrending resistance line connecting the first two highs. The third high was our actually our test. That came almost exactly to 111.01. So number one, we have a long-term downtrending resistance line. Number two, it comes very close to a large run figure. 110 is important, 111, 112. Number three, we have a double top pattern. We hit highs of 111.23 in August 17th, and the second high, 111.01. Came within 22 pips. That's number three. I see the dollar CAD closing below our swing lows of 106.72, I think the dollar cat can go a lot lower. If I see the dollar cat close above 111.23 highs of August 17th, which is the highest high we've seen, actually going back to the third week in July, I think the dollar cat can go a lot higher. Now, if I had to close my eyes and guess, I would probably guess to the downside, just because the trend is your friend. And the trend is certainly very much to the downside. And this is nothing more than possibly another consolidation pattern in a long trend to the downside. But a close, a break and a close above 111, a break and a close below 106. If a crystal, I would predict the future and I would say, you know what? Do if we the dollar cad, or not a certainty, if we had a very good idea that the dollar cad was going to be 500 pips higher or lower in the next 30 days, me as a day trader, if I think it's going to be lower, I'm only going to look for short trades. Because some of the short trades will make 10 or 20 pips 100 pips lower. Let's go to a one-hour chart. Zooming out on a one-hour chart over the past two trading days. Here, this is a one-hour chart. This is the past 10th to the 8th. This is the past two trading days. We've moved down about 100 pips in the past two days in the dollar. So let's see. I would imagine if we ran a computer model that bought at a certain time or sold at a certain time, the selling strategy in the dollar. So 
would have probably made a lot more money than a buying strategy because after every candlestick, we have a higher probability of going lower. And if I would sold the short the dollar swiftly at any random period of time, I would probably be making money because we're right near the lows. If I bought it, I'd probably be losing money. So the point being is that even though it's to buy the euro dollar, we're at new highs. If we had bought the euro dollar, well, the breakout, you know, only really occurred yesterday in the euro dollar. But remember, non-farm payrolls was last Friday. Non-farm payrolls, uh, we closed a level of 143.03. Imagine if we had, in fact, we don't have to imagine. You see these two horizontal lines? I forget I drew, I forgot I drew them. This represents the, the trading range from last Friday's non-farm payrolls. Let's go back and see if I can find those levels. Uh, probably not. Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. So let's see if I can make this clear. These two lines, 142.74 to 142.86, these two lines where the mouse is now, that represents the 15 minute trading range last Friday. Well, going back and forth, this white vertical line marks off where that trading range was. You see where we were? Right about there. Okay. Now, eventually we broke out, broke down. But above 142.86, and we could argue to say, hey, as soon as we get above one dollar can, 108.15 were the lows, are the lows, 108.65 are the highs, and as soon as our 9.15 a.m. Eastern candlestick, as soon as the candlestick closes and we see another one emerge, we'll know for sure. I think it's a pretty safe bet. This is our trading range. Wait for three more five-minute candlesticks to close above resistance or below support, but more importantly, do not forget to reference longer-term charts because Sometimes it can mean a lot, lot more than that. It's 9.15 a.m. Eastern. We have our 15-minute trading range, and I am just about out of time. I do want to thank you all very, very much for joining us. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you may contact me directly, www.forexfinders.com. I want to thank very special thanks to FX Street for hosting this webinar. Please see FX Street's calendar. Because of that. Again, if you have any questions, I thank you all.